All right, we're starting right off with something different. This is going to be the longest McGolf video I've ever made. Why? It's because I did a really good interview, or I had a really good time with the interview, with the head of R&D at Wilson Golf. We talked a bunch. I had to cut it way down in order to answer a lot of questions that, well, the whole video was initially about. It just kind of took another turn, so it's a good thing. So, stay with me. You're gonna have, you're gonna, this is just packed, absolutely packed full of information. So, let's take a look and let's get started. Yep, it's a Wilson day at McGolf. Let's see what we're doing today. Well, welcome back to the McGolf shop, not the fitting room, because we have quite a bit to do today. And it's all Wilson product. We've been waiting. There's been a delay in the golf industry, as most of you guys know. And we finally got some of our stuff in from fittings at least a month ago. So we're really, really happy that we've got it. So, and it's just right for around this neck of the woods. The golfing season has just started. So I think it's going to work out just fine. But I wanted to show you and talk to you about the different ones that we're putting together, what we're putting in them, and then a few building techniques. So, you know, hey, stay with me because there's also going to be a surprise about what the heads are about. So let's take a look at what we're doing. All right, first in the line are the D9s. The D9s is a distance iron for certain, and Al from the Space Coast is getting those. We got a six through a gap wedge, six through a gap wedge for that. And it's really hard to kind of get the, the actual quality of, the, of these colors, but I, you know, it's like a, black, a navy bluish to a, a goldish color. And then we have a set of CBs, and we have two sets, but the, each one's a little more different than the other. So in this particular one, you can see we end at the gap wedge. All right, and this one's for Gary. But Gary wants a couple of driving irons or utility irons. So we're going with the, in the same model, we're going to go with the driving iron. Then Chris, who we've known for a while, Chris is uh, from Kentucky. So he wanted a set that basically was at the wedges, so we put a set of pro staffs in with another set of CBs starting at a different spot. So he was the one that, he is leaving V6s and he's going to these. So this is Chris from Kentucky. This is Gary going to Canada. And this is Al going to Florida. Now, what are we putting in them? Although you can't tell, but we have these. All right, and these are KBS Max 80s, and nice garbage can in the back there, but there it is. Gary is getting some TGI 95s in the KBS model, the graphite shafts. I have a set of these in my clubs. They're extraordinarily stout. They're a very nice shaft. Chris, who we've fit before, is getting some KBS 105s along with some wedge shafts. So we're going to put these all together and we're going to talk about them. We're going to talk about some club building basics and the very first one is you've got to know what you got to know. And that, what does that mean? Well, it means you got to weigh everything out. When you weigh everything out, it gives you a good starting point of knowing what adjustments you may or may not have to make. We're looking at seven gram differences between the heads and that's for standard builds, right? And then we're going to weigh the shafts to see if we have anything that is super light or super heavy, something that would be way out of the norm. Now, truly, if you have a good shaft company, the range should be no more than, I would say, like three grams. And that's a stretch, right? Most of these guys are around two, but we give them a three a range just so we get there. Because why? What? And here's one of the questions. Ask, put it down in the show notes if you know the answer. How much weight change in a shaft does it need to be before it becomes a swing weight issue? Before one swing weight point, what's it take? Look it up. Uh, I've said it in other videos. I'm not going to make you search that, but look it up. Put it down in there and see what you find. But three grams, two or three grams is not going to impact it too bad. Then we're going to weigh grips. And the grips are 
normally they're pretty good. They're within a gram of each other. Every once in a while, maybe two, but that's going to tell us what, if we need to add weight, what we need to do, what we can expect on flex, things that are coming out and that kind of stuff. All right, as part of the surprise, this is John Pergande. He's the head of what they would be the R&D team or the innovative section, the vice president, whatever we want to call him. He basically, he's the man. All right. He has done an outstanding job with Wilson since he has been placed in charge, and I hope to see him there more and more and more because the stuff that they're putting out has been outstanding. So let's see what he's got to say. So let's start with the uh, let's start with the, the the wedge, the staff wedge, and now you guys have two models, right? You got the uh, tour, and then this one. Yeah, I'll even go with we have three variants for for this line right now. We've got the the standard sole, which is you know a smooth sole from from front to back. Uh, this you know that's most typically based off of our, our history of our other wedges, our premium PMP wedges that we had prior to this, uh, and it's just starting to take an approach of of what our tour players are asking for. Anything that we do in the staff model realm is all about you know uh, an eye toward that what could be a better player or something that they could easily set down and, and feel good about playing. Um, and, and so this, it has a, a modest distance, you know, modest wide sole. It's, it's not uh, anything crazy wide. Uh, and we're trying to keep it as playable for the largest number of players that we can. Um, we also then offer a, what we call our tour sole variant of that club. And it provides a little extra relief in the, in the heel side and off the trailing edge of the club. Um, probably not, you know, uh, perfectly suited for most players, but if you live in a, if you, you're in a, uh, play a course that has a tighter lies or you're a more highly skilled player that wants just a little bit more versatility about opening it, uh, up a club around the green, uh, for flop shots and other sorts of things, or a little added versatility and control of your ball flight, that's the club for you. And then, and then the third variation that we have is, um, our staff model HT, which is a higher toe uh, version of, uh, of a wedge that has run score lines all the way out to the end. That does have a little bit wider sole. That's strictly a, you know, a, a higher lofted wedge that we have anyway from 56, 58, and 60, uh, because that really is, you know, maximum versatility around the green uh, in getting those, either those flop shots or those low and check shots or hitting it out of some rough uh, and, and allowing that to the club to get through the ground and, and get to the ball uh, as easily as it possibly do it. And <laughs> the, it's the four. It's funny that the fourteen with the how a fourteen with a wider or a narrower sole works versus something that's a wider sole but maybe only ten degrees. And it totally different feel, totally different working. And, uh, well, that is the balance that we've had a varying widths of soles over time. Um, and, you know, we need to have some variation because there are some attack angle differences that players have that we need to account for with some different offerings and different bounces. But really, the, the, the challenge is, is how high does that leading edge get off the ground? Because we still want to get that ball uh, hitting the, the score lines, hitting the face of the club. And so if you just picture a very high bounce with a very wide sole, it would be very difficult to get that club all the way to the ground, particularly if you were playing from a tighter lie. Um, it is why also a lot of sand wedges that are perfect clubs for, or, or more suited specifically for the sand will have slightly wider soles with slightly heavier bounces because you have some forgiveness underneath the ball uh, that then the, the, the club is able to ride on and, and get the club face to the ball um, as you're trying to get out of the sand or, or some thicker rough. And, and, and that really goes to, you know, course conditions. You know, when you talk about fitting people, a lot of times there's the, the spec fitting of what a lot of clubs are, but a lot of times it's just the clubs in your bag and simple questions that you can, you can ask or, or, or look to uh, in terms of what are the courses that you play? Are they very hard and are they very tight? Are they very lush? Do you have a lot of sand? Is it that really tightly cropped sand or is it the real thick fluffy stuff? And those are the things that that can really start, you know, dialing in a wedge play uh, that you don't have to do anything different. You're just asking the right questions to pick to, to pick the right equipment. You know, one of the other things that really kind that really makes this the, the wedge stand out is that little bitty word right there on the bottom. You don't see that a lot in a lot of wedges. You know, there's a lot of speculation. Oh, this one's forged. Nope. This one's forged. Nope. And you go, how many are out there? Mm, two. <laughs> and there's one right here. 
And they go, well, really? And I said, oh, yeah. Well, I think what you're getting to on the traditional was it created from bar stock. It was not, this is not created from bar stock. We've, we adopted a process of, uh, uh, of casting it to a near net shape and then going through the process of finishing and forging. Now, the material difference is it is a carbon steel. It is very soft. It does provide most of the, you know, all of the uh, uh, feel that you can get, particularly as a better player, if you're, if you're hitting the ball cleanly, it's something that you can notice. Uh, but what it does do is it allows us to more precisely control the shape from one club to the next. And, and that's such an important thing for us. And if you go back to our old days of, of forging something pure, you know, pure bar stock hammered into, uh, hammered into shape, there was somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 grams of weight that are, are polished off of the club to get that club to its shape. And then, you know, score lines uh, stamped into it. Uh, along with all of the graphics that go with it. And so you were heavily dependent on the operator that happened to be doing the polishing at the time. Uh, and, and very often you could even tell which operator was doing it because everybody had their subtle little tweaks about, you know, one does it, you know, one way, another operator does it another way. And so you, there is actually an inconsistency to those clubs. Now you can fall in love with those clubs and maybe allow some versatility if if you're a tour player that came in and said, I need a special grind, it was a little bit easier to execute because there was more material and, and more craftsmanship that goes into it. But I feel like what we've done is take, do our research up first. We put, a, we put the, the goal out there of the wedge that we want and it's, it's our job to deliver that wedge uh, one after another after another, uh, you know, so that you can count on what that shape is and the performance that it's gonna deliver. Now, one of my, here we go with the whole reason, you know, I, on the video I've got, two sets of those guys. So what what turned out that made this thing so special? Well, I, I think we have to look at the history of what that club is and where it was born. Uh, you know, this replaces what we had uh, in our, uh, our V6 model, yeah. which was an extension of the V4 and V2 and going back to the original FG Tour that we had going back six, seven years or, or, or so. And, and this is a, a model designed for uh, our best players, our staff model and Wilson advisory staff players and, and our, our, our PGA members that we have that we that provide input and feedback. And so as we move from year to year, it starts with a shape and we are tweaking that shape in just subtle little ways. We're tweaking that sole in subtle little ways to get the performance where we want. And then we're addressing the questions that show up or the performance needs to make, uh, you know, adjustments in the head. And then and then it partly becomes a, a marriage of art project and engineering function. We need this club to perform. When you consider some of the better players in the world, there is still a need for, uh, you know, long shots and forgiveness. You know, a, a tour player can use some MOI as much as anybody. And that's why we've got a, a tungsten weight in the toe of the club to balance out some, some weight and give us a, a little bit higher MOI um, uh, for sure. And that's, that's primarily longer clubs. We are really focused on keeping that weight low because, uh, you know, tour players want to hit the ball up in the air as well. We're the best players in the world. And when you look at some of the shots that these guys are performing, you know, that seven iron can go 200 yards for a lot of players. So, it, you know, it's not forever. It's not needed to be, you know, the super forgiving club for everybody. But when you hit a ball that's 200 yards, that's just inherently a long shot. So we got to bake in as much of forgiveness as we can, given given the head shape that we've We've got, you know, one of the interesting little bits that we, we do here is, you know, in this world of small tweaks, we had took an already very forgiving V6 club and we put a little actual technology in here. We were doing computer simulations and research about how we can get better feel. And, and one of the prominent features that that club has in the back is, is a metal connection from the top line down to the sole. And, and it's a small thing. Uh, but that metal connection up to the top line, um, you know, reduces vibration and provides much better feel by adding some stability to the top line without a, a large increase in uh, the center of gravity or, or moving that greatly. Because we believe in that that forged blade product feel. So we want mass behind the, the impact area of the ball. Um, the consequence of sometimes doing that, though, is, is, the, is the top line. And, and so adding some support to the top line brings that frequency of vibration uh, or increases that frequency of vibration, but lowers the decibel level uh, of what the sound is. And so, you know, it, 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 if you're, hit, if you're a very clean ball striker and you can hit, you know, some clubs and get some comparison, this is just really going to, really going to 
top out what your your feel and sound and your experience is going to be with with the club and of course these are just what these are they're just a tad stronger than the v6 is just like by a degree it's not like something crazy right yeah, essentially it's it's a degree. I tell you, going back, the V6 was was about three to four years ago. We're you know we're looking at specs of what traditional products were going to be, uh, and then you know let's go back two years ago or so when we introduced the staff model blades that that was the primary club we'd worked on with with Brendan Steele and was used it to hook into Gary Woodland and it was really the club that helped you know seal the deal for his for his joining the Wilson staff. At that time, we actually took an audit of our of the of the staff players that we had and and to a man, all the clubs were a degree stronger than what the traditional spec was for uh for the V6. So we just made the nominal spec 1 degree stronger. Still very traditional. Uh it wasn't a it wasn't a feature trying to gain distance and, and do some stuff. There are there are things that we do in our in our distance clubs that are are truly about getting distance out of it. That's not what this was. This was about reacting to the marketplace, reacting to the, who these consumers are, who these better players are and we've got to make sure the gapping is right. We got to make sure the uh the distances are right. We need to be relevant and competitive in the marketplace uh, against other equipment, but it's really more about making sure that the player is getting the correct results, the correct gapping, uh, and the correct distance control uh, across the set. The thing feels great. I mean, the thing just, and it looks good at a drill. I mean, this is, if you're looking for like the cool traditional club, this would be the guy right here. I mean, I just don't, I it just, the coolness in the bag, the way that it goes, I mean, this is this the all around golf club. I mean, that's just what I, you know, what I think about it. Well, it harkens back to a lot of the history of what golf is in terms of forged and metal. And it's not a blade and it still has some forgiveness on what blades provide. But to your point, I think that you brought up a great point about what looks good to a player. Um, you know, either can go all in on forgiveness or you can go all in on some sort of design aesthetic and you get to a blade. And, and the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Uh, I think players sometimes maybe sell themselves short or sometimes take an ego approach and play the wrong clubs for, for the wrong reasons. A club still has to look good behind the ball. And, and if that is in your head uh, that this is what a golf club is going to look like, then I would, you know, I would fully put and support the idea of putting a CV down in front of you and, and letting you play that club and, and not try to push you into something that's larger or more game improvement. Um, if you can get away with looking at another club and, and you'd have a different approach, then it's okay getting something that's a little bit larger, a little more forgiving, a little more game improvement, uh, as long as that, you know, suits your eye and, and, and you don't have any negative reaction to it. Now, is, is this made in the same kind of process as the wedge? Yes, absolutely. Uh, some of those features in that back cavity would, you know, really can only be put in by, by that sort of process. And, and, uh, with the amount of work we do to get the the, the frequency and the, the simulation aspect of that, of the performance that uh, of the structures and the features, you know, we, we want to make sure that we have the utmost control of that. Uh, I mean, down to even we do mill the face of those clubs before we put the score lines in. So we're making sure we've got a great, clean, flat face. Score lines get put in. They're milled in versus being, uh, you know, stamped in if you really want to go back to the old days. So it's really a huge component of precision that goes into these these clubs that process and and that uh, that capability to put all those all the pieces into place so that so we went from the bottom to the middle now here's something that you're gonna you're gonna really have to help me on this one because this this is starting to grow this category is starting to grow in, in quite popularity all of a sudden I think it's a little bit beyond me, but <laughs> I don't like this thing. No, it's it's for everybody. It's a it, that's a staff model utility. Again, you know, the staff model name is something that we're designing for our advisory staff members and our tour members that uh, um, that serves a purpose to their game. So every club is important. When you're limited to fourteen, you want to make sure every club has some has some value. And the value that we have here is. Is, is, is a balance between a long iron and perhaps a hybrid or perhaps a five wood or three wood. Uh, I mean, we've got, uh, I don't know, Padraig Harrington plays it, Gary Woodland has one, Kevin Tway, John Augustine, they're all, they're all carrying these as they're dropping something out of their bag and putting this into the bag. Um, and sometimes it's course condition, sometimes it's uh, 
uh, weather conditions. Sometimes it just could be where pin, pin locations and things are when you're swapping things out. These are designed to go a long way in a very controlled manner. Um, there is a very thin hot face. You get incredible ball speeds. Uh, they're you know, relatively easy to get up into the air based on the center of gravity and based on the construction. Uh, and so, so they really serve a purpose uh, to, the, to a lot of these players that are, as you start to transition out of three irons, maybe even four irons, uh, to add some, some pure distance and pure playability where the demand of, of you know, that control, precise control goes down and it's more about, I need a little extra distance, uh, but not have it go out of control. You know, the, a three wood, for example, is really all about distance. And, and yes, you need to be able to hit the shots with it, but the expectation of, of finding a pin is, is probably a little bit less with a three wood than it is with an iron. And we're bridging that gap with something like this so that you can, you know, you can tactically work your way around a very long golf course. So do you know the, all the lofts available in this? And then what might be the most popular one amongst the staffers? Yeah, uh, I, between our staff guys, the, it's usually the, an 18 or a 21. We've got a three degree increment in between them. So 18, 21, 24 are, are the most popular or, or you know, are the core of the line. We do have a 15 degree uh, that was created at one point for Gary Woodland. Um, and, and a few people have picked up and tried. I've taken to the golf course myself. Um, it's not for me at that point. I'll just stick to my three wood and, and be quite happy. Um, uh, and he, you know, his comment to the 15 degree was he actually hits it too far for what he was trying for what for the gap that he was trying to fill uh, in his bag. And so so he, he toned it back. And it's I think he's ultimately now an 18 down, bent maybe to a 19 or something like that. Uh, Kevin Streelman plays plays in as a, as an 18. I'm trying to think. Kevin Tway is an 18. Harrington, I believe, had a 21 and a 24, as does Brendan Steele. Um, the interesting thing, you know, and it's not just the staff model utilities. It's it's you know taking clubs across your your bag, and and I think the core of what something like the staff utility does is it it offers a specific purpose to the golfer, and so even a lot of our tour guys will take the three iron or the four iron out of the blades and put a CB in, or if they're playing the CB irons, they'll take the three iron or four iron out and they'll put in uh, a D seven forged or the staff model utility. Um, and it just depends on, on, you know, what gap are they filling in their bag? Make sure you have a, you know, a club for every shot that you're, you're trying to hit out on a golf course. And in some cases, maybe you're not playing it every week. Uh, maybe you're swapping out a five wood for for a long iron or, or this or, or utility, um, just depending on the shots you know you're going to face. The thing that I like about this club is I feel like when I we, we started designing it and I take it to the course and play it, it was it was a club that I feel like I could hit it as far as I wanted to, you know. So it provided a good four iron or three iron break. I would play the you know the twenty one or, or sometimes the 18 and, and then if i wanted to hit it off the tee as a as a driving iron um i would hit it and it would just go as far as i needed it to go but in a very much a controlled manner so a super versatile club if you if you get a chance to try one uh it's amazing it's a it's a new tool that that you can add to your bag to to, to do something that you might not have already been able to do all right and then the last but not least for certain is this new one and i gotta think that your thumbprint is all over this claw golf club you know <laughs> based on what i've seen before because we've talked uh every year we talk about it and we and uh ever since you've gotten to the lead the these things have gotten cooler and cooler and cooler every time i see them come out but well, that guy oh that, yeah this thing i mean and we always talked about you know the and, and now I will say this, and we don't have it with me, but, uh, you know, we'll go through this. And we've always talked about, you know, Wilson has been, you know, when you talk about irons, Wilson joins the conversation almost immediately, right? That, that's a no-brainer. And the, the real question is, is when you get past, say, the utility iron, where does Wilson come into the conversation? And since the, what, the C300, which is about the time that you joined on board with it, the 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 look in the bag has just grown and, and not by little bitty steps whatsoever and that d9 that's in there now in the driver category is is 
it just looks really, really good, you know. And We're it, good, yeah. And it's, thanks. And I did the test on it, and it's right, it's it's right up there with all the rest of them. I mean, well, I said like, you brought up a couple of things: the D9 family with the driver and the irons. I, I, I'll talk to the iron first for just a little bit here. Is you know we've got a, a little bit of a history of. Uh, of this, what we're calling our distance iron category. And it's usually something with a D in it. Uh, uh, this is our latest incarnation. The, the, general, the general thought going in is that, you know, we want to make this club as easy and as long as possible and appeal to the vast majority of players who just want more enjoyment out of the game. And the greatest enjoyment comes from a forgiveness and distance that you can hit for a lot of players. So the insight that came here is like, how do we, how do we get people to hit the ball higher and hit the ball faster. And, and, and so the two main things that we got to think about when we go into a club like this is we've got ball speed, which is the power holes that you're showing there on the sole. This is a brand new configuration. It's a technology that we continue to evolve every year. Our, our tools to develop power hole technology is to uh, are greatly increased. We've got, uh, you know, I don't know, 150 cores of software and simulations running, you know, thousands of simulations to, that converge on what is the best solution. And it's a solution that maybe me as an engineer would not quite think of in these nice orderly power holes that we've, we've had in the past. So we pick up ball speed there. And then we also want to think of launch angle. So the primary uh, objective of the first design here was to get how can we make the weight and get the weight as low as possible to improve, uh, to improve the trajectory and launch angle. So we can get a lower spin and higher launch it's just like drivers it's going to help get that ball up as high as we can and go for a longer distance and the higher we can get it it's actually going to come down steeper and still be able to stop so you're not going to have to worry about control we don't rely on spin or stopping a ball in the green we rely on trajectory and getting the ball up in the air um, you know and then once we package all of that together uh, the next thing we do is we you know we've we've spent a lot of time and effort on uh, on industrial design and and you know so this goes to our, our design group that goes in and, and tries to find a way to, to emote the, the distance that we're getting out of it. Classic, simple design. We've got little pops of color, but it needs to look like a cavity and look like distance and look like forgiveness. Um, one of the challenges that we have all the time with, with products like this is that, I, you know, I, I'm, in some cases, I would call this male jewelry. This is a uh, expensive proposition to buy a set of golf clubs for for anybody. And so when you, when you do take them to the course, you want to feel good about it. And so you want them to look good. They need to look good and they also need to perform. So we've got to check a lot of boxes when we get into that, uh, into that iron world, uh, because this is, that is, that is the one way that a lot of the golfers get to, to show off, if you will, or, or to express a little bit of their individuality when they step, they step onto that first tee with, with friends and, and, and competitors. Well, Mr. Bacondi, I thank you again so much, and hopefully we'll we'll be talking again in January in much warmer climate. Yeah, <laughs> boy, I'll say. All righty, sir. Well, again, thank you so very much, and and uh, you know, it, hopefully everything works out up there. All right, thank you, Mr. Bacondi, for taking the time to actually visit with us. The and so you guys understand, this is what we are. You know, the idea of what goes into an iron head, the playability factor, the thinking that goes through the OEMs when they go to design some of these things. So, for instance, and a real big, a real quick, you know, recap. And as we understand that, you know, the CB is the, is the head that is for the ball striker, the player, probably somebody that's not fighting a slice or faded has good control of his golf game, where the D9, although a very cool looking club, is more the D for the distance model. The lofts are stronger and it has more offsets, so it also helps play the fade. Two items that are differentiating are the sole and the offset, right? The D, the D has a very large sole width. And that's good for a guy that might be a digger. If you ever have those, part, those problems where, you, you know, when you get through, this would tend to bounce you out, where the CB does not, okay? And does that mean that a digger can't play those? No, you're just going to take a monster divot, and you're going to just have to strengthen up to get through it. However, it's, it has a big radius sole, and, and so it's not nearly as penal as some of those clubs that have, like, knife edges. We see the bottom of the sole do this and the loft angle do that. 
It's very rounded. So you do get away with a lot of, you know, a lot of, you can get away with taking a divot, but it's not going to be nearly as smooth as, say, the other one. And it doesn't have a lot of offset. It has some, but very little. So, and, it, and then when you look down on it for you guys that like the bigger, the small top lines, certainly one is in each category, right? That's what we, that's what we do. So that was what that was all about. So what we're really going to get into now is basically question and answer sessions of, I get a lot of emails of, hey, how about this? Hey, how about that? And that's what we're going to use while we're building these particular clubs. You see me with this on, and the reason why this is, I'm getting ready to do a brisket on a brand new grill that I got. So I'm going to have to go do that real quick. I'll be right back. You saw that I had two sets, I had or three sets. I had two sets of CBs and one set of the D9s. Now they're all a little different. And let's talk, the very first question is taper tip versus versus parallel. All right, taper tip versus parallel. Now taper tip in a in a decimal form is three five five. Parallel is three seven zero. Okay, and what's the difference is is that at the very end it looks like that instead of like that. All right, now can you put a taper tipped hosel? I'm sorry, can you put a taper tip shaft into a parallel hosel? The answer is yes. Yes, you can. It is, you, you have to use an, a, a, a shim, and they make a specific shim, a, a specific length, a specific width that goes on the end of the shaft as you insert it, and that helps you take it up. Now, can you put a parallel into a taper? Right off the bat, the answer is no, because one's bigger than the other. Now, if you have the equipment, like I do, you can ream it out and make it accept those types of shafts, and that's what I do on a regular basis. I'll give you kind of a for instance. We're doing the right. This is the utility plus one set of the CBs that goes with the uh, well with the prototype and the uh, KBS TGI 90s as a graphite shaft. I have them instead of mine. They only come in taper tip. Well. But the CBs are taper tipped hosels. So the fit was fine. It went together very, very well. And I did that. So, what are the pros and cons of each one of these, right? That's the second question. Taper tip typically are what we would call constant weight, meaning each shaft comes in a discrete length, one shorter than the next, and they all weigh the same. As a whole, not every one, but as a whole, as you shorten a club and you add more stuff to it, it will tend to get stiffer. Now, by little bits and creeps, right? Because you're only talking grams per half of an inch. But at the very end, the top to the bottom, the very end, there can be a substantial difference in flex. Does it happen a lot now? Mm, I will say sometimes. Not a lot, but sometimes. It's my expectation that it will happen. And if it doesn't, then grand, right? But that's kind of the expectation. Now, what do you get back from that? And that was the big deal, and the reason why everybody was so up and, you know, really got to have a taper tip was the feel, because it felt the same no matter what. That is a discussion, right? And that's a, that's a chicken or egg kind of discussion, which we're not going to do right here. That's a different day. The other one is the parallel tip into the parallel hosel, okay? Pros and cons of that guy. Well, what it is is that they all come in the same length, right? They're right around 41 inches for, a, for an iron. So what do you do? Well, that allows you to do matching, frequency matching, meaning that regardless of the weight of the head and as long as you're trimming very well, you can make these match each other. Now, they say, yeah, but you're cutting off length. And you're right, you are, but they all start at a longer length and you're cutting them down. So you're, so you are the weights the same? Would they be the same? Well, no, because you start with a longer shaft and then you start cutting off a little bit of each side. Now, the, the argument could be made is, does this weigh more than that? Well, maybe, right? You could check it out. So you get frequency matching. Now, the consistent feel topic comes up. Uh, I don't see where anybody would see any different. As long if the swing weights were the same, the only thing you have to mess around is total weight. Okay, and total weight again. We've talked about that one. Total weight to me is far more important than the swing weight. Now you don't want them wildly out of out of balance, 
but if somebody is wanting a, a lightweight shaft but wants a D4, that's an unrealistic expectation. And vice versa, if a guy wants a 20, 120 gram shaft but wants a C8 swing weight, that's just not going to go, right? And there, there's so many things you have to do to the club that makes it unbalanced and then it doesn't swing properly all just to get that one parameter when there's so many more to choose from. Pro is you can frequency match. Uh, the, the other pro is that all you have to do is get one length and you can weight sort in order to put them in there in order to help with the, the weight that we talked about. Uh, the con is if you're a real truly monster field type person, that might not be what you want. And that's kind of your differences. Guys that are doing custom stuff, you will see that uh, it, 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 either way, right? I've got three sets and I've got one with a taper tip that you've already seen that I build. I've got one that accepts a parallel tip that we're going to use. And then I've reamed out one in order for it to accept the shaft that we wanted to put in there. So each situation is different. Is one better than the other? No. I would say one each situation makes one better than the other. And that's where we need to go. People will ask, where do you put the spine? Well, I put the spine at 12 o'clock. Uh, there's an, a chicken or egg kind of concept, whether you put it towards the target or away from the target, that's true. And, but what I do is I put it at 12 o'clock and then I will put the head on so that it faces at 12 o'clock as well and I twang up and down, which is the next step looking for flow, which is flat line oscillation, that's straight up and down. That's the way I do it. Now there's people that will twang back and forth. As long as they get, the whole idea here is you're making a consistent club. They all rack the same going down through this set, through the set, and they all feel the same going through the set. So it, it's, per, you know, again, chicken or egg preference. Uh, I prefer it that way because when we, again, I've told this story before when we started, aligning it was uh, almost illegal. And But if you went to the neutral, which was straight up and down, because the shaft would bend down, right, then you could do that. And that's what we did, and we've always done that. So that, and it created a very, very consistent club. All right, back to the assembly part of it. We've got to basically glue the clubs together. And how do we glue the clubs together? Well, you use epoxy. Now, I use, I've used this. It's a 24-hour epoxy. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, one, you know, for one dab of that, same one dab, and you mix it together. It's got a really long work time. You can get a lot of stuff done in that particular case. Now, I have switched from this, although I still use it. I still have applications where I will use this because it's very, very, very good glue. However, I've had a handful of failures, and, and when I say a handful, this is handful over tens of years, right? And now that I'm starting to send stuff to you guys and you're not in my state, i.e. Hawaii, Canada, Kentucky, all these places that would be mailing back and forth, I want to reduce that number even further. And what I did is I went back to the tour and asked what they were using, and they were using a, a 3M DP810. Now, this stuff, the reason why you don't see a lot of it is, is because it's expensive, right? This stuff is expensive and it's very fast, right? You don't get, when you do this, you have a, a limited work time, okay? A limited work time. And it's, it's right around enough to do about six clubs. And I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have to split it up. So we're gonna do five and four or four and five, whatever. And I've kind of got a graduated uh, pull on this in order to do this. So what you have to do is you have to set everything up. I have all the tips done, right? And now we have to, I will have all the ferrules ready and I got my mixture ready and I got things to, my paper towels to wipe it off. So now I'm just ready to rock and roll and that's all we really need to do. So we'll give it a squirt here. Let it drain out a little bit. We like, I get very efficient with this stuff because it is, you know, it runs, this stuff, this stuff is like $8. Uh, the, the golf work stuff is a fraction of the cost of this other stuff and that you're just basically paying for no failure. So, okay, so we 
get it mixed up. And then we'll add some centering bead. I've been asked of whether you can use, there's stuff called Black Beauty you can use. There's people who use glass beads. Um, I just, it's just too easy for me to buy it from the Golf Works and that way I know I'm getting the same thing every time. Alrighty, so I'm just going to grab one from the middle just so I can make some room. A little bit on the tip so I can punch on the, I push it down. Now just to save time so I don't fight it, I heat it up so I can push down. Which is down real easy now. And the thing with epoxy, and this is an acrylic, is that it doesn't take a whole lot. All right, epoxies work. Epoxies work when they have a very, very thin line of stuff to work with. All right, now I line my lines up for my flowing. There we go. I'm going this out of camera because this is speed oriented. A little piece of tape so it doesn't move. Up on the rack it goes. So one more time with that. A little bit right there. A little bit. Get it on the end, get it started. I know this one's going to be a little tougher. About five seconds to heat it up, and then we push it on. Get a little bit of glue on the end, doesn't need to be a lot. Spin the shaft around or the head around. Line up our marks. Tap it in, make sure you're seated and then wipe off the excess, the top and the bottom. This is, this is what separates the men from the boys, is that guy doing that right there. All right, so we're on our way. All right, all three of these sets have been uh, useful in our explaining of some of the questions that we had. The, the ones going to Gary in Canada, talked about the taper tip. The ones for Chris that are going to Kentucky, we got to talk about the assembly. And now, the ones for Al going to Florida, we're going to talk about the gripping section and what grips can do. So, in order to install a grip and you don't want to make a mistake, you basically line up your grip and you make a mark that is beyond the, uh, the throat of it. All the grips have a, a marking that's about a half of an inch back. And if you can put it right there, the, the bottom of the butt to that, you go to pull your tape, no matter if you're long or short, if you make it in there, you, you know never to go past that line and you always have enough left over at the bottom. Now there are two ways that close, you want to close the bottom and that's for using the either, you know, you can use air or you can use the solvent, but you can either fold it over and close it or You can make another mark. And do I like calling the twist maneuver? And you get it on here. Now the thing about putting the tape on is to make sure you don't have any wrinkles, crinkles, or any really big overlap. And if you get a lot of length, you can do the twist. If you have a pair of scissors, it works. If you have your gripping thing, it works too. And you just push it in nice and flat. There you go. So now grips. Grips are the only thing that connects you to the club. They're the thing that makes you feel confident about the club. They're the thing that makes you grip it and you just know you're going to hit it or it could just go to the opposite. You're going, wow, this thing really is not very good. It's very slick. I'm going to have to do something different, which promotes something different in your swing and promotes basically a poor shot. So you want to make sure they're in good condition. Clean them off after every so many rounds, three or four rounds. Just need some hot water with a nice uh, aggressive towel, right? And then that'll take off the hand oils. Now, as far as the types of grips, you know, bigger hands means more weight. That's just what it is. Smaller hands mean less weight. Now, what we have here is something in the middle. This is a standard grip from Wins called the Dry Tack Light. 
Now it's a standard grip. It'll probably be a little smaller because how they get light is making the underlisting smaller, thinner. That presents a problem in itself. However, when you have a lighter grip, you get a little bit more head weight. And in actuality for this setup, because we have an 80, 85, which is really closer to a 90-ish gram uh, shaft, that when you, hear, when you put this on, it's going to promote a, a heavier head feel, which is what Al was looking for. So now the thing about putting on a thin grip is that you have to be really, really, really careful about sliding it on initially because the underlistings like to give because they tear real easy because they're because they're their thinness, they're very, very brittle. All right, once you get it on, you get your alignment the way that you want it. You tamp it down. You do a second check get some of that and then what I'll do is just wipe it down so it gets a nice even cleaning before we go to the next one. So again we put it into a speed clamp. I like the speed clamp but you just saw it's just that fast. I use the solvent. How come I don't use air? Because I don't have room for the compressor and Mrs. McGough likes the solvent more than the air and she puts on as many grips if not more than I do so she wins the argument. Nice and easy, get it started, slide it on. Make sure your alignment's good. Good to go there. And then wipe it off. Thank you guys for watching if you've stayed along, <laughs> stayed this long. And what I wanted to tell you about was, you know, we had the one go to Canada, we had one go to uh, Kentucky, and one go to Florida. And as you can see, they all turned out, I'd say, pretty doggone good. They all had their different needs, and they all provided me to be able to explain to you some of the questions that I get asked pretty frequently. And not to mention, though, that we got to talk to one of the best guys in the industry as far as research design, being able to talk to people, in John Pergandy. So thank you again to Mr. Pergandy. Thank you guys for watching it all and sticking with me for the longest video. <laughs> and as always, let's see your scores go low.